So our first presentation is listening closely. Listening is important, I think, both at work and at home. I think I have a better track record at work than at home, but um, that's another story. Uh, to speak on listening closely is Daniel Perlin, the UX director at Droga5. Um, learn to listen, learn to exercise your ears, brains, and bodies to learn to listen better, both to ourselves and to others, in order to design for and with people. Daniel? All right, I'll do it by hand. That's cool. Oh, he does. Great. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Let's try that again. How's everybody doing? Yeah. All right, all right. Let's bring it together. It's noon. Let's keep going. First, I'd like to thank Chick and everybody. It's really nice to do this. It's a great chance and opportunity to kind of interpenetrate disciplines and really start to learn from each other. What we're going to do today, theoretically, is we're going to talk about stuff that you already know. In fact, you've known it since the beginning. And it's something that you've always been doing. And we're, just, we're going to talk a little bit about listening. Let me get rid of my mouth. Cool. So we're going to talk about this in a maybe a little bit different way than you're used to. We're going to talk about it as a strategy for designing. See if this works? No, not at all. Cool. Awesome. So what is listening? How do we listen? What do we listen to? Why should we listen? When? To whom? Now, these are really, really basic questions. In fact, these are the questions I ask myself every single day. I want to regress a little. I want you guys to go back. Heraclitus once said, we're most ourselves when we are at play. Let us get back to who we are a little bit now. And let's talk in these basic questions. This used to be a song that you probably all sang in one way or another. Who are we? have to say it together. There's that part, too. You guys are participatory. Enjoy. Ready? Who, what, when, where, why, how. Yeah, we're going to do some of that stuff today. You're going to have to get into this. It's not like your standard kind of speech and act. Now, this is what I do. Right, the great ecosystem map of forever interdependent disciplines that should remain unknowable and never fully defined unless they overdetermine your creative impulses, may create and iterate. Yes, this is really what I do. UX is design over time. I want you to think of design, and I want you to think about time. What's something else you do over time? You listen. You perceive. In fact, you can't close your ears. You can't close your body off from the world you're in. We exist in a context, and our responsibility as people who make things is to pay attention to that context. I want to expand some of your concept, maybe a little bit, of what listening means. And in order to do that, we're going to start with some examples of what you think it might be. A lot of times, we think of nature. I don't know how many of you like nature. This guy likes nature. I'm a big fan. And this is a beautiful project by Studio Weave. It's called a trumpet, and you just go up and you just listen in a great you know, way to amplify nature. And that's beautiful, and we love to listen to nature. And it's very nice. And sometimes we like to go out and we like to party. This is a baile funk in Brazil. Yeah, get down. That's a whole wall of speakers. Yeah, that's a good party. That's also another way that we like to listen, and it's a good time. But what does it mean when we start listening this way? What does it mean when AI listens? Or what does it mean when a drone listens? Or how do you listen to a drone? We start to get into the question of listening as a strategy, and we start to get into the very questions of what it means to listen. That's a lot of yellow, but it's the, one of the three things you need to remember, who, what, when, where, why, how, and listening as a strategy for design. This is how I do my practice. I listen to myself, and I design. I listen to other people, and then I design. And I try to listen to many people and design. And this is the project that I like to do every day. So what is listening? We're going to go through this. OK, yeah, you could do this for like a whole PhD and really enjoy that. But we're going to do this in about, I'd say, four minutes, if you guys can give me that long. OK, cool. Listening versus hearing. Cool. That's your ear, or a rendering of your ear. That's the cochlear section of your ear. And what happens, how, all of you know this, especially the cog sci guy out there. But what happens is your ear is vibrating with these cool cilia all the time, sound waves that are all around you. Every time air moves, waves are made. Hit those cilia, send electricity into your brain, and it's translated. It's awesome. As you get older, like this guy, what happens is your, wit, your ears, the little cilia start dying off. You hear a smaller range. But you guys know all this stuff. This is hearing. Hearing is cool. We do it all the time. In fact, it's said it's what you first do when you're in your mother's womb, even before you see. And some people say it's the last thing you do when you're passing on. And so we should think about that, because you can't close that off. And it's very important to hear things. But what is it? Can we hear everything we listen to? No. Some things we don't. 
This is, of course, SETI, and we're listening to the stars, and we're listening to outer space, and we're doing this through radio frequencies and micro frequencies that our ears can't hear. So ears, listening, yes, but a lot of ways to listen. And that really matters to this last thing. Nowhere is nowhere. You are somewhere. We're always in a context. We're always listening in a context. It's a question of attention to that listening. This is, of course, the matrix. It's probably the only nowhere that there is. Not Most of us don't live there. Um, we're going to do something now. Um, for those of you that are still awake, we're going to do something right now. Uh, right in front of you, uh, thankfully, from the folks here at Create Tech have provided you with pens and paper. I would like for you to get a pen and a piece of paper. We're going to do this together. We're going to do a little exercise. Why not? Cool? All right. So we're going to do listening exercise 1A. There are 12 of these. I will be giving a number of them. This is a self-plug. Um, I'll be giving a number of them tomorrow in a workshop. If you get into this and you want to come around, I think there's still some spots, so come around and hang out. But this is how um, sort of stimulate creative practice through listening. And we're going to do something together. We're just going to do something that you guys know how to do really well. Cool? All right. When I say go, and only when I say go, <laughs> we're going to close our eyes. I'm going to do it too. We're going to close our eyes. It's cool. And we're just going to listen for one minute. And when you get done, open your eyes and write down what you heard in words, and then quickly sketch what you heard. Now, there's, there's no right or wrong way to do this. In fact, there's no semiotics of sound, so you can't even mess up. What we're going to do is we're going to do this together, and we're going to take a minute of our lives and just listen to where we are. Is that cool? Is everybody cool with it? Yeah? All right. Uh, all right, one minute. Ready? And go. Close your eyes. Okay, you can open your eyes, and now, without speaking, just write down what you heard. Take a minute, write down what you heard, however you choose to express that. And when you're done writing it, you can draw a small sketch.
Okay, so I have a limited amount of time today, obviously. So we're gonna, you can keep going a little bit while I chatter for a moment. One of the moment, one of the great things about this actually is we can already understand that user experience is designing over time. Look at how much time that took. Look at how one minute of your day to perceive your environment. What an incredible opportunity. But now you've gone and you've created something out of it. Um, so who's like outspoken? Who wants to read what they, they wrote? It's okay, there's no messing up in this one. You, it, nobody? I'm gonna have to pick, oh, somebody in the back, all right, yeah. Uh, oh, you gotta stand up, nobody. All right. Yeah. Awesome, did you draw a picture? All right, show it to your buddy right next to, right next to you. Let him take a look, cool. Yeah, yeah. Is it, is, it, is it like kind of what she was describing? Yeah, it's great. Okay, anybody else? Somebody else? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Oh, here's the trick. You have to read exactly what you wrote because we're trying to make a language. Awesome. <laughs> that's great. Sound is a volume. What is, oh, that's really impressive. What did you draw? Oh, that's great. So there's no messing this up. This is great. I do this every day. I do this every day. I've been doing, I started as a sound designer originally and moved into UX about 15 years ago. And I still do this. And it's one of the best ways to make stuff. For example, um, I have to keep moving, but you guys can feel free to do this. I have a sound journal. I love it. This is a great sound um, scape maker. In fact, he invented the term soundscape. This is R. Murray Schaefer. And this is how he writes music. And that's his soundscapes. And we can start to think about your notation practice and your beautiful clouds, they're not so far off from that, and maybe your, um, your clicking is in the bottom. We start to really do that. But a lot of the work we're doing right now in the world we at, uh, and we live in are, are concerned with this, networks. How do we listen to a network? What does it mean to listen to a network? These are, of course, the standard networks. You're centralized, decentralized, which is the way we operate most of the time in your distributed networks, right? And they look like this because it's super physical. This is the, one of my favorite websites, just the undersea cables. It's a website and it's dynamic, but I don't know how often they change. Um, and it's uh, fantastic. These are the undersea cables. This is how you have your internet in your room right now. And this is, of course, the NSA's version of the same thing, and that's how they listen to it. And one of the things, the things that you really should keep in mind about that is that listening is happening all the time. You're listening through networks. We're listening to networks. Are we listening to how we're listening to networks? Are we paying attention to how we network? This is a really great set of problems to work on. And one of the things that um, I like to concentrate on, my energies, is on listening to people. I really like people. It's a strange phenomenon. I like people, um, and I try to find new and interesting ways to listen to them. One of the ways we listen is through data. Um, this is, of course, Aaron Koblen's flight patterns. Um, it's a beautiful work, but it's basically just behavioral data over time. It's a beautiful way to listen. How can I listen to your behavior over time? What kind of experiences were you having? My real jam, my homie, is Henry Dreyfus. He died, you know, designing for people. He's incredible, right? Incredible guy, basis of most of the stuff you do, including this ship. He made a telephone for Bell, and then they were like, hey, you want to make a ship? He's like, yeah. Actually, you want to make two ships? And they're like, yeah. And so he made twin liners. He didn't even know how to make a ship. So he said, I don't know how to make a ship, but I want to make a ship. So he built a ship cabin, and then he built a second entire ship cabin, and he said, Go and hang out. Tell me how you feel. How did that go? What's your experience? Learning from others. This is one of the main ways we do stuff. We interview, we ask. Just like learning from Edward Snowden about certain things, we can interview and ask on the streets. But it's not enough just to hear the words spoken. We also have to pay attention to how bodies in the field behave. And we have to learn to understand and listen to bodies. That's right, it's starting getting a little bit wider, the concept of listening. Can you listen with your eyes? I would say yes. I'm saying learning to listen with your eyes is learning to pay attention. What does two umbrellas up in the air mean in a nice conference room in New York City versus a nice streets in Hong Kong? I'll give you another example. This is a cat. This is not my map, but I added the cat. Um, this white is the cat. And this is the cat in an afternoon. And the cat hung out in the armchair because that's where cats chill. I'm like a cat, I'm gonna hang out in the armchair. And then probably like maybe you guys got lucky and got a Meow Mix commercial on here. And then so the cat hung out of the TV for a second. And then the cat was like, please get me the hell out of here. Or, or alternately it's like, oh, dad's around. I wanna hang out with dad, he's coming in the door. 
How do we observe over time? How do we learn to listen to our rooms? How do we learn to listen to our spaces? It's a beautiful project, and it's what I would say is the beginning steps of listening is um, one of the principles of designing. But I would also say it's a way of designing for others, designing for others to listen. Um, this is uh, essentially a bit of the work that I have done as well as um, Droga 5, where I work, which I like. And um, it kind of falls under these categories of inputs and outputs. It falls under the categories of sort of the different approaches to listening that we take. And it sort of takes um, ways of making for listening. I'm going to show you a few things so that it's not as much about tooting horns as it is to say these are some of the approaches we're onto. And at the end, I'm going to show you uh, the stuff I'm into coming up. Um, this is like our process. It's like everybody's cool, yay. All right, so um, this is um, one of the things early on that worked on. This is a typewriter um, that I hand wired to do email at the same time. It's an old Olivetti, the kind of classic Valentine. And the thing about it is that's fine, that's nice, yay. But um, I think the really nice thing about it was that you, the emails were public. That email everybody had to listen to. As soon as you typed it, it printed. You weren't able to take it home. It sat there on a desk. And you could go through everybody's personal messaging. And in fact, it read the email aloud when you hit send in the room as well. What does it mean to listen to others' private, private messages? Or what does it mean to speak with the dead? Thomas Edison's last project, the last seven years of his life, spent working on a telephone to speak with the dead. They said he, he did it. So I went and I tried to dig through his archives. I did the research projects. And this telephone, actually, you can speak with the dead if you want. Um, this is um, a project I just did for the Venice Biennial of Architecture. And the only reason I bring that up is because it's biennials, so they are in pavilions. So this is in Costa Rica. And Costa Rica has a, a problem, uh, which is that people don't necessarily think about it as a country. They think about it as a nice destination to visit. How can we get it to better articulate itself and be heard, but also make the point that it's disappearing because of its destruction of its rainforest and other. So this is a radio station that built like a little radio station and then it, a little application for the radio station which self-destructs. At the, end, the last day of the biennial, all of the files are deleted, it deletes itself. It's a self-destructing radio station. And the same idea here, which is to say, how do I keep things ephemeral? How do I keep things light? This is a bag I did for moleskin. We carry one bag, it makes the beats. You carry another bag, it makes the music. But more importantly, how do our bodies behave? How do we listen to what we wear? How do we listen to how we behave in space? One of the big projects we just spent about a year, year and a half on is the launch of the Toyota Mirai. It's the um, hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, which is uh, a great product, um, and it's a really difficult product. It's, it's, it's fantastic because it emits water out its tailpipe. Crazy. Um, but the, the, trick, uh, the trick about it is, is it needs hydrogen. And one of the things about hydrogen is it needs fueling stations. So we were, like, we were talking with Toyota, and we were saying, look, how do we figure out where we should put these fueling stations? Let's let people tell us. Let's listen to what people have to say. So we created a mapping system, which you can go on. It's still live. Just to show your interest. Be a hand raiser. Say, I want this. Now it's launched. The car's out. I'm very excited about it. But it's a long road to being able to deploy it. We're very excited about some of this map having an influence on how infrastructure is being built across the US. And another way that I think we can listen is by amplifying things, right? Sometimes it's about speaking. Sometimes it's about helping others speak and amplify. This is <clears throat> women's rights, um, global women's rights. That was a data set, a really important data set that was created by the Clinton Global Initiative. And as an advertising agency, we were able to work with them directly to help just get out that information. How do you get people excited about data? Like, how do you get people excited about an amazing data set? And what we actually did was we just got rid of things. Sometimes signal to noise is the issue. Sometimes it's about not speaking. So we took away women from billboards, from magazines, from all over for a day. And it drew a lot of attention. And it got on you know, Today's show and things like that. And you know, uh, that's an incredible thing for a data set to be featured on, <laughs> right? And how do we listen to that? So it's a very exciting project, I think, and also a good ongoing one. It's an open source data set. Please feel free to use it. And another way that I think signal to noise actually became an important element was um, this, this is a very famous person, Giselle. And she wanted to change up her life a little bit. And she said, I'm, I'm about sport, and I really want to do that. And people are going to give me a lot of shit. They're going to give me a really hard time, and I don't care. I'm going to blaze ahead. And this was about will beating noise. And so what we did was we took her, and then we just said, what's going on when she does this? What's going to happen? We released the film, and then we had, like a week later, we had this site. And what we did was we just kind of put the tweets in, sentiment-based, into the video. 
It's not that crazy of an idea. We've all probably thought about it one way or another, but it's because it's such a charged issue for her. And what was beautiful about the experience is she doesn't care. Her will just goes beyond all the noise going on around us. So a lot of times um, when designing and making, um, I try to remember um, a little bit of what Henry Ford once said, uh, which you've all heard before too, which is <clears throat> if I listened to everybody, we would just have a faster horse. So you need to think about you know, listening to yourself as an initial project as well. And I think that's an important one. Um, I just quickly want to touch on this, which is that um, we are in an era of um, intense surveillance of bodies and um, everything from uh, immersive experiences all the way into how you got into this space now. And sometimes it's good to pay attention to that too. I think getting people to pay attention to the world around them helps uh, raise our standards for design and quality. This actually tracks your face. This is for the United States of Terra. And it, was, it tracks your face, and that's all it does. It picks one person, like, like that person in, walking in right now, and it would track them. And no matter what any of you did, she would just return the gaze, and she'd walk about and just look at you. And how do we do that? How do we get you to focus in on the fact that you're actually already doing that? It can be very subtle. And this is a, a project which is a, a video game. The only point about this is that <clears throat> sometimes things can be inverted. This is a video game, like, ah, right? This is a video game to help you meditate. This is a video game to help you meditate that actually when you sit and you breathe with the video game, it teaches you to breathe because it watches your chest rise and fall. Just like we did now. How can we actually take a few moments, take a few moments to listen to what's around us? This is, of course, um, an Oculus project. Um, I, I don't need to go into too much of this. Um, we have a lot of folks who are super champions of this. It's a new sort of domain. But I look at it as what's going on with this, the most compelling stuff is what's going on in the education field, actually. What's going on in the world of people letting others explore spaces they haven't been or can't be. I do think it's very important to have immersive experiences that are incredible at getting your ads across and my ads across. Way to go. But I think the real compelling power of this is getting people to learn and to trust it as a medium. If we actually think about the computational media, those of us that came up through what I'm looking at is a large swath of the Apple generation, we learn to trust that apparatus. And trust engineering is a subset of UX's job. My job is to garner trust in systems, get you to trust each other, to get you to listen to each other, and to trust it. And I think a great way of doing that is learning about the thing itself, starting early and starting to learn to trust the fact that this is an incredible opportunity for learning about new places in the world. So the two areas that I want to talk about um, really briefly that I'm interested in, one is brains. We talked about that today with the Facebook folks and some other folks. Brains are amazing. You all have amazing brains. Um, I'm a big fan of your brains. I think you guys have much incredible brains. And I love um, very much working with uh, the advertising folks that I work with. I love working with the folks outside of advertising. But more importantly, I try to think about what would my, what would, what, what would my brain do? What would your brain do? How do we learn what other brains might do? We have to learn to listen to ourselves and to others, but importantly, what is the power and the um, capability of, of the brains? And finally, the last domain I'm working hard on right now is this, which I consider to be the most compelling issue right now, which is uh, the environment. And I think that there's a vast resource of untapped um, potential for energy generation, as well as using that for um, articulating um, issues uh, globally. Um, recently exploring um, with the Toyota Mirai, we made fuel out of everything from, from cow shit to, um, uh, to lemonade to garbage itself. But in that, really started to unpack, oh my gosh, you know what? Actually, the vibrations from a NASCAR track make enough power to do this. The sun that you're, you're dealing with, one, if, if, Three of you in this room actually began to do home solar, would make such a massive impact. So we're really starting to work on this as a problem set. And uh, that's it, kind of. Um, we're gonna do one last thing together, if you guys want. Um, this is the thing you need to remember. This is it, this is all I do every day. I just sort of ask this. I hope it's something that you guys, out of this thing, if you remember nothing from Daniel Perlin, which is, you know, how could you forget that? But seriously. <laughs> If you remember nothing from Daniel Perlin, right, this is what you should remember. Do this every day to everything you encounter. I tackle this. This is the problem. We're not doing this enough. This is my little mantra, and uh, thank you. Okay. So 
So I have, um, we've got like a thing we can do, is a lot, right? And also I talk really fast because I live in New York and all that. But I think um, there's a lot we can do. We, it's like raise of hands or something like that. We can either do one more listening exercise together, which is super weird and like, or we can ask questions. Which would you guys rather do? Neither. You could just like let me go. I could just say go. Which one? Question. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy idea, right? So basically, trust engineering is kind of this thing that um, uh, I, I teach some time at this place called ITP, which is here in New York, and, and some of the folks from there, um, we, we hang out sometimes and we talk about, hey, you know, what are we actually doing? Like, what's going on? Like, what's my, what are we actually doing? A lot of us come from multiple backgrounds, right? And what we're doing effectively is um, design. So. I really want to make a point about that because a lot of us come from an arts background and it, it, art's job is to ask questions and to, it, this is super like brutal. Like this is not, of course, there's total Venn diagram, epic Venn diagram overlap here. But on one hand, art's job is to ask questions and on the other hand, design's job is to solve problems, to provide answers. And we've all kind of migrated onto this land of, hey, you know what, we, we, we feel a certain kind of compelling need to solve some problems and provide some answers. So what we've decided to do is find things that we believe in, find things that we care about, find things that we can stand behind as much as possible and garner trust in those for ourselves and then help others trust it as well. And trust engineering within UX is the job of saying this system has to live on its own and be trustworthy. It has to be a trustworthy system not just because it, 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 it's secure, which for all of us data farmers out here, we don't really care that much, but we actually care um, more about the fact that it feels as like a safe place. And that how does that happen? I click here, it takes me somewhere nice. I tap there, it's a beautiful experience. I can engage or find something new or discover, as we've been talking about. So that's what it is to engineer trust, is to say, I'm gonna be honest with you. Transparency in advertising, honesty, good experiences. That's sort of trust engineering's mantra. And it's really hard, but we keep trying to do it. So I hope that kind of answers your question in a more broad sense. Yeah, I guess it's questions. Okay, um, so tomorrow, if anybody, if I haven't scared everybody away, um, to, oh yeah, one more, oh, two more, all right, sorry. BuzzFeed speak. Yeah, Jonah? Hi. No, not Jonah. Um, Greg Coleman. Okay. Um, and he, about, he was talking about native advertising uh, and how they make these, you know, articles that are really ads or the videos that are really ads and people spread them virally because they're cute with cats or whatever. Yeah. And, and there was somebody from the uh, Department of Journalism uh, in the audience, and during the Q&A, she said, what are you doing to identify these ads as ads and let people know that they're ads and not content? Sure. And he said, I, I, I'm not going to tell you what we do right now, but I'll tell you that a year from now, my answer will be, we don't give a shit. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious to hear your perspective on that comment. <laughs> just to, to be curious. I mean, my, my perspective, it's a bit, it's a bit, um, it's a bit of a challenging question, right? I remember when I, I started in advertising, I've been in advertising actually a long time as a consultant and then full time for a number of years now too. And the, one of the first things I heard was advertorial and I freaked the fuck out. I just was like, what is that? Oh my God, advertorial. Because I, you know, I was like, that seems so crazy. And now it's a given, right? So I, w there's kind of two levels of response to that. One is that, yeah, of course, they don't care, and it's going to be going away. Snapchat gets, you know, drives 20% of bus feeds traffic. There's not a lot of concern right now between that, right, relationship. There's not a lot of like, oh, well, actually it was an ad. No, it's funny. <laughs> or no, it's sad. Okay, so what does that mean for making stuff and garnering trust and, and a good experience? I think that there's been a lot of discussion over the years of how we can imbue advertising with um, depth, with emotion with meaning. There's been a lot of concern about that. Actually, the talk before this was like, hey, where's all the emotion? Where are the 70s gone? I've, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. emotion is great, and it's a great way of providing depth and long-term relationships. Everything is a brand, everybody brands everything. So is that a paid experience or not a paid experience for, for being on a particular media pl placement? I think that's the question that people get into. I mean, honestly, the cynicism that is, is deep is, is also something that you should, you should um, champion. Because in a certain sense, why believe the New York Times? In a certain sense, why believe Huffington Post reporting? In a certain sense, why believe anything? I would invert the proposition and say, actually, truth should be questioned constantly, and that everything is an ad, and therefore, you should actually invert that as a starting place. Listen to the sources that they're coming from. So for me, it's more interesting to say, actually, you know what? He's right. Because you know, AOL bought Huffington and all those kinds of things. But in the end of the day, question your sources, I think, is a, is a, is a, the, I think that's what the younger generations are actually doing. So I have zero seconds, but yes. Design plus time? I can. I mean, I, I don't want to bore people to tears with it. Um, I, how many people here have a, a flying idea of what UX is? And you can be totally honest. Show your hands. Cool. This is an amazing audience, right? OK, user experience design is something that's ephemeral. It's very difficult to, to nail down. Um, a lot of times, there's an attempt to sort of do that as a project, to say UX, well, it sits between production and creative and design, and it does these series of tasks. No. What is the user experience of uh, you typing on your iPad right now while we're talking to each other? What is the user experience of uh, we all had walking into this incredible and yet bizarre room? What is the experience that we have with each other when we're not talking to each other, sitting next to each other? That's a user experience. You are a user all the time. You are using things. And you are using the space around you, and you are being used by it. So it's about a project of understanding yourself over time. That is actually how I would try to broaden the framework of what it is. It's often attributed to computational media. Computational media does something nice. It gives you feedback. It does things for you. But so do you. Talking with you is great. And it's great. And it's a great user experience that we've had just now. And I really appreciate the question. So hopefully that doesn't answer your question. Good. All right, good. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, thanks everybody. And if you're around tomorrow, um, I'm giving a bunch, it's like a short thing, but it's a bunch more of those little weird exercises so to help stimulate some creative thinking. Okay, thanks.